All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today on the North Face Speaker Series. Um, I'm your host, Stan Evans. I'm a commercial photographer out of Los Angeles. And today our guest is Jeff Staple, a creative visionary with work encompassing creative direction, fashion design, footwear design, brand marketing, and he has been a driving force in defining what streetwear is. Uh, if you aren't aware of his podcast, The Business of Hype, you should be because it is one of the best marketing assets on the internet today. And I love watching and tuning in. And today we are going to chat about the current take on these topics. So let's get right into it. Jeff, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Stan. How are you doing? I'm doing great, man. Just chilling Thanks. over here in LA. How about you? How are things in New York? I'm freezing my buns off in New York, so... Well, we better get your nupsy down over there and get things taken care of. I got, I got the North Face on right now, yeah. All right, all right. Um, well, I mean, like, I just wanted to get right into it because people know who you are, and I want to talk about the crossover between, like, music, fashion, and, like, extreme skiing, and the first connection, really, that I saw between mainstream skiing and black culture and winter sports, which, for me, I was diving back kind of into the archives and I really looked at it and I was checking out Blizzard of Oz, which was directed by Greg Stump, which kind of in the scheme of things in these days, he was kind of like the definitive, like white Mars Blackman, you know, from the Jordan commercials. Do you know, yeah. do you know, do you know? And so realistically in this part, he did this thing where they're doing a selection of skiers for his movie, right? And they're all skiing in the segment in Squaw Valley. And they had the background to go go music. And mm. if you don't know go go music, go go is like kind of like a late 80s, early 90s dance hall type of music, kind of like bred out of Washington, D.C. And it was the first time I'd really seen or heard black culture used in a ski film in that way. Right. And so for me, I was just like, whoa, okay, like what's going on here? Like, check this out, you know? Because like for a young black kid, I was in Alaska at the time. And so I'd seen. Scott Schmidt and Glenn Plake and like stuff like that and people in Warren Miller movies, but taking it to a Greg Stump film, I was like, okay, you know, so I thought that was a really interesting start right there. Absolutely. I mean, it kind of reminds me of um, that sort of uh, uh, Basquiat, Lee Kionez, Debbie Harry moment, right? Where there's kind of like a merging of these two things uh, that are normally considered completely separate, starting mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. And I think that can kind of like kind of we can go deeper into that, but also that was kind of like the whole burgeoning emergence of steep tech, right? And so I look at steep tech as like you and I being on these like different paths, but parallel. So I was living in Montana and you're, you know, in the East Coast. So I'm seeing steep tech being used like Scott Schmidt and Dan Domley and Groove in the Key of Ski. So I just did a segment on that. And, and Dan Donnelly and Scott Schmidt are both wearing steep tech in this Alaska segment. And so looking at that and how it transcribes into like New York, into a Method Man video, and like his two of his background people in the video were, were rocking steep tech. Right, it's crazy. Cause when I was it, sort of in high school, this was now in the early nineties, um, I would spend my days hanging out on Broadway downtown in the village in Soho. And there was a couple of stores back then that were really um, iconic. Uh, David's D is one of them, um, Active Warehouse, Broadway Sneakers, Canal Street Sneakers. And these are like the type of stores where like they would wrap the sneakers in saran wrap so that like you wouldn't get fingerprints on them. You know, it was that type of a store. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, the people who worked in the store, the people who hung out on the store were all head to toe steep tech or Nupsy or Denali's. And it was just the way they reinterpreted innovative technical performance gear uh -huh. into fashion was like so fresh and dope and of course like i couldn't afford any steep tech at all like that that stuff was so expensive but just the aspiration of like man i want to be as fly as these guys and to be quite honest at the time not really understanding the the technical need that you were understanding from skiing and snowboarding like i didn't understand why you needed that stuff but you know like taped seams for example mm -hmm. a great example of like i don't know why a kid in new york needs taped seams but it looks fresh as hell you know what yeah. i mean that's some that's some winter valley 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 wind off the lake there you know but yeah. <laughs> but, 
it's funny because when you think about steep tech and it was like funny because people don't really understand like at the day they have elbow pads and like shoulder pads and they zip in pockets which had foam and then they have like butt pads and knee pads and so the whole thing about that because it was designed by scott schmidt right was he would like leap into shoots and he would do a smear turn and so like doing a smear turn like that is like honestly you have pads in your butt so you wouldn't bust your ass you know yeah. And right, so, like, right. elbow, so it was like protection for like if you like tumbled and things like that and so it's funny like seeing how that goes and that had pit zips and like vents you know things like that for for hiking but then seeing that being translated into urban areas right yeah. and so well, i just, you know why those elbow pads and butt pads are helpful in the city right yeah so like here your take on that like how it kind of like in city culture and so like i wanted you to kind of delve into that story yeah i mean the 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 story goes that the reason why technical apparel like North Face, like Timberland became so big in the in the late 80s and early 90s is because the dope boys would be wearing them. You know, when you when you stand out on a street corner for eight hours a day, just standing there in 20 degree weather or 10 below, it's going to get cold. And oftentimes you're leaning up against a concrete wall, a brick wall. And so you need the reinforcements just like the skiers and snowboarders do, but for a vastly different reason. And I even remember like the pits were dope because when it was freezing cold outside and then you go into like a store that has heat on, you would just start doing, you know, you would do the yeah, zip. Like someone you get on the subway. Yeah, the subway, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Like you get crowded, it's all crowded in there after you've been out the street. Yeah, so like, you need those pits, right? Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's fun. And I, I would guess that North Face was not intending for that to be the use case. Yeah. But we we urbanites and city dwellers figured out the the use case for those um, innovative technologies. So it's pretty cool. Well, it's funny because even just things like like the waist belt, you know, like, you know, like the cinch strap for your waist and so it's snow skirt. Yep. Well, like, so like basically like, so graffiti artists could boost spray cans to like steal stuff. Yeah, yeah. You know, they they put it in their pockets and like walk out of the store Within that, and it's funny because, you know, obviously we're diving into the circumstances of drug dealing and street culture and things like that. And, and it's kind of a touchy subject, you know, we're kind of like going about this thing. But I think something that's really important to understand is you can't shun street culture and the circumstances that create it and then turn around and capitalize off it, which you see a lot of companies nowadays trying to do. They're like, they don't, they like, they see the cool vibe of it, you know? Yeah, they don't want to understand the story of it, and they don't want to want to like talk to their originators like that, right? Yeah, I mean, if if you guys can watch that um, the Beats by Dre commercial that just dropped this week, it's incredible. I mean, it talks exactly to that, you know, like yeah, you can't. I mean, you can't take something and love only little bits sure. and pieces of it, and then sh and then keep everything else out of it. You yeah. Know? So I think you have to pay homage to like the day one creators. And I think that's a big thing of like looking at like originators and fashion connoisseurs like Dapper Dan, like, you know, from Harlem. Mm -hmm. So it's just funny looking at while he was biting Gucci culture and like making these different things, these leather patterns and selling it like, like on street corners, out of his own shop. Like they actually, the, the cops came and shut down his whole cease and desist yeah. store. Yeah. And, yeah. Like, yeah. You know? and so looking at, Gucci doing the cease and desist with them and then actually going about realizing, oh man, we actually need to celebrate this guy. Yep. He's originary. He's in these streets. He's developed in his cred. And that credibility gave our brand credibility in the streets. You know, like Dapper Dan did that. You yep. know, totally. Then them going and working on a deal with Dapper Dan to bring him in house to Gucci and have him do things. And that's the right equitable way to like reward those day one visionaries. Yeah. Yep. And similar story happened with Supreme and Louis Vuitton, you know, back in the day, Supreme was sort of remixing LV logos and LV ended up sending a cease and desist and a lawsuit to, to Supreme. And then just a couple of years ago, they came together for an official collaboration. So those kind of like um, moments of recognition for the underground, the, the bleeding edge, the taboo is really cool to be like, kind of corporate America say like, no, you guys actually were part of the ingredients and the reasons of why we are here today. So it's a nice sort of nod of recognition. And honestly, that kind of takes me into the next thing that I wanted to talk to you about is like some of the guests on your show on the hype of business, like business of hype, sorry. Um, they are fascinating. They're amazing guests yeah. that you get, like just a wealth of knowledge. And so I was really impressed with the Kirby Jean Raymond. He actually talks directly about that, about 
connectivity to customer. And so just being that and like, and being involved and, and being conscious of your customer and what they want and what their kind of demands and what they're looking for, yeah. just being aware, right? And exactly. so I think that kind of like goes to a little bit. And then also, um, Drika Lingnit, um, yeah. talking about who worked for, works for Timberland now, and like worked for Nike for a long time doing, um, God, what was her job? You actually, well, I can't remember. She had the like longest title in your in your global energy head of collaboration and so it was like it was like a long like it was like it needs an acronym. Yeah. <laughs> she was basically responsible for Virgil Abloh and Off White and Nike and Sakai mm -hmm. and Nike and Tom mm -hmm. Sack and Nike and you're basically like um you're like a brand DJ is how I like to think of it. Yeah, you know, you're taking two records and you're trying to figure out where the beats match. You know. And so one of the things I really liked about the conversation you had with her and one of the things I really respected about that conversation is that she was a great person who worked on spotting talent and cultivating talent, not rifling, yeah. you know? And right. so I think a lot of these brands are looking for people, but they're kind of trying to like, how can you come into our brand and do it kind of our way and then just kind of like make us hot, you know? And yeah. And so like the thing that like looking at what Drika did and some of the collaborations and the way she looks at the world, she seems like she has a very curious nature. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I liked about it is like, I almost like fascinated when I looked at it, it was like, she was kind of like the Debbie Harry of, of footwear, you know? <laughs> yeah, she's a, she's a great conductor. Yeah, she's a great conductor. So like when you look at that and like the originators of like, you know, of hip hop, and she is the kind of people who kind of put Fab Five Freddy and like Basquiat DJing on their stage. Like she turned her audience onto what they were doing, but she didn't steal the show. She was kind of like, here I am and I'm with this show. Check out what these guys are doing. Right. You know? That's that's a very um, difficult personality character trait to find in people because most people who can operate at such a high level and have meaningful talks with people like visionary people like Virgil or Sakai or something mm -hmm. like that, you know, oftentimes those people are very, very alpha, right? Mm -hmm. They're very like a, a, a type, yeah. triple a type and then, <laughs> but to find that same person to be able to be like, okay, here you guys go. Let me now go behind the stage. I don't need any of the fame, the guts or the glory. Mm -hmm. You guys do it. That's a rare personality trait. You know what I mean? Um, and, and so that's why people like you mentioned Kirby, Drika, you know, these people are really special. Um, John Jay is another one that I would highly recommend you listen to uh, from yeah. what I interviewed. But yeah, it's it's amazing. These I, I love to call them conductors, you know, like these are people that, you know, even, even I use the conductor analogy because even if you have like a great drummer and a great flute, flute player and a great pianist separately, without the conductor sort of like harmonizing them and making sure they're performing at their best, um, they could sort of be offshoot and not as successful as they could be together as a group collaborating. And that's really um, the power of great collaboration. You know, collaboration nowadays is such an overused word and shame because um, it's not automatic. It's not a layup. Doing great collaborations is not like it shouldn't be a checkbox on your PowerPoint presentation. Oh, we need we need great collabs. Let's get some great collabs in. You know, like yeah. it's not that no. easy. These, these are organically driven things, and if they're not organic, the public nowadays, especially young people, especially Gen Z, they can really smell like a BS collaboration, and and then you're just wasting your time, money, and energy. And I think that comes down to really too when you're actually looking at collaborations and looking at like having forethought to create something like with this, the sharp spear tip, right? And getting people in and getting people in so they don't necessarily like just drink the Kool-Aid and, and put out more stuff like that. Like, well, I, want, yeah, I mean, I want to say something to like leaders who are in a position of power right now in this, in this um, poli politically, you know, Black Lives Matter driven, mm -hmm. driven state. I think the best thing a lot of these leaders can do oftentimes is just listen and then allow the experts to do what it is that they need to do. You, there, there are times similar to what we're saying with Drika, mm -hmm. where you don't have to meddle and have your hands on something. Yeah. Having, the, having the wherewithal and quite honestly, the grace and the power to say, this is not my lane. I'm gonna allow you, give you the resources. Yeah, 
tell the story that needs to be told in your way. Mm -hmm. I think that's really powerful to be able to step aside like that. Well, it's funny because it gets back to I was watching a, 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 a talk that Virgil was doing. He was talking about let's be known for the ideas and the execution. Yeah. And so I think it's something like that where people a lot of times just want you to come in with the ideas and they're like, okay, we, we got it here. We got it from here. And like, it's like, but yeah, that's like, honestly, once you've got it from here, that's where you're going to mess it up. And right. it was really right. interesting listening to your talk with Drika. And she was talking about how like her initial interview, the person who interviewed her didn't want to hire her. And then his colleague talked to him and he told her yeah. him about her. And he was like, no, you need to hire her because she's so different. She's so thinking outside the box. Right. That's what we need. And this is what our brand needs. And this is what our company needs to move forward and progress because like we're on constantly progressing. People get stuck into the battleship rather than a speedboat narrative. I'm like, honestly, right now with COVID-19 and Black Lives Matter and women's equality and stuff like that, you need to be more of a speedboat than yep. a battleship, you know? Exactly. Yeah, and like another example that I kind of want to bring up too, which is kind of right now, is like we're looking at um, LeBron James and Maverick Carter's new media company, Spring Hill Entertainment. Mm -hmm. So in the midst of a pandemic, they got investment of $100 million. Yeah. We're talking about global worldwide pandemic. So if you look at a black owned media company, it's going to be telling stories for different marketers and different entities like that. For them to come to 100 million investing, that means people are leaning into it and they're understanding the value of multicultural dollar and how much people are trying to spend and where the future is going to go with sports and entertainment and music and equipment and outdoors. And so it's going that route. You know? Yeah. Absolutely. Every, every brand needs to start figuring it out now. Yeah. I mean, similarly speaking, like, you know, our brand staple, we've had an incredible 2020, knock on wood. Like our 2020 is, is going to outpace 2019. And it's supposed to be a terrible year. You read all the reports about fashion is, is dead, you know, in, in the time of COVID, everyone's struggling. But I think one of the secrets for us is like being able to maintain that authentic voice and having something to connect to. I don't think it's a case where like people are not buying things anymore. I think they're being much more careful and selective about what they're putting their money on, you know. Um, and we've seen it ourselves where like when we drop something, it just it still flies. It still sells out right away. And I think our our fan base that we've been developing and honing for the past couple of decades is is appreciative of the fact that we're still out here hustling and doing the thing that we do. Well, that brings me to my next question, which I was going to say is, what's one of your favorite collabs this year that you've done? Um, damn, there's so many. I mean, probably the one recently, to be honest, is like we we just did a Hello Kitty collaboration. Mm -hmm. Which is dope because Hello Kitty is obviously geared towards women mm -hmm. and, and uh, kids, and we don't make women's wear and we don't make kids. We make men's wear, mm -hmm. but it's really it was it was an interesting sort of thing of like how much can we expand on our audience base and how much can kids and parents of those kids and girls mm -hmm. wear men's you know men's streetwear. It was like a nice blending of you know gender, unisex, age. It was like all these things that were being bent. Um, and every collaboration that we do, we try to really like bend the rules and come out of left field on stuff. And we've got a lot more coming out this year. The other one that we recently did that I'm really proud of is um, we we worked with a, a shoe designer and customizer named the Shoe Surgeon. Mm -hmm. And we did these uh, shoes that were called the Just Votes. And essentially mm -hmm. what you had to do in order to get a pair was to prove that you voted. And we we didn't oh, say you had to vote. Was the ACLU? Yep. Yeah, we worked with the ACLU as well. Um, and that was a real head flip too. And just hearing kids, like we heard hundreds, if not thousands of kids saying like, I literally would not have voted if you didn't dangle this carrot in front of me. And some would, some will argue that like, oh, you shouldn't be commercializing and capitalizing on this movement. But it's like, yo, to me, it's like whatever gets their foot in the door to yeah. get them to be aware of it. If it happens to be a show, so be it. Because now they're going to get hooked on this ability to make change, which is really dope. I know it's like we still have the old Georgia election coming up now, which will be interesting to see how that plays out. <laughs> um, so diving deeper into that, I wanted to talk to you because I mean, like, and get your take on multicultural marketing from what ad agencies are doing. Because something that was really interesting to me was really um, actually North Face's whole reset campaign and just the authenticity which it went about telling athlete stories, like watching some of these pieces with. Um, 
the narration and seeing the different climbers and some of the pain and struggles that they've gone through, it really humanized what's going on in the world with me, like seeing how that, and like it resonated. And so I like seeing those different campaigns and something that weaves a personal message that resonates with customers. So I want to kind of get your take on that. Yeah, it's, it's raising the bar. It's really just elevating everything. You know, people at agencies and brand owners, they just have to step their game up. They can't come out with like, hey, buy this two for one, buy one, get one free. You know, it's got to, those aren't just, those are not going to last now. You know, you really have to tell a, a true authentic story. And um, I think, you know, if you can picture these sort of like meetings that are happening in boardrooms with like keynotes and like whiteboarding. Oh, people, man, PowerPoints. Yeah, PowerPoints. But people have to stop with the BS. Yeah. Like, get to the root of people, human nature, what people are going through now. Um, and there, and if there's any silver lining of this pandemic and of the Black Lives Matter movement is that it's making people really look in the mirror and check themselves. You know what I mean? And some of this is what you're seeing in some of the advertising that you're, you're, you're mentioning. Um, it's just it's just shining through where like real it's showing that real messages can happen without a detriment to your brand. I think the past thinking was always like, oh, if we were too honest, we might lose customers or we might lose business. But you can see, I mean, you mentioned the Kaepernick thing as well. Like these are these are brands that are like doing better and better while telling the truth at the same time. Yeah, it's building more quality into your brands. Like it's like people, they're putting in a personal emotion with your brand. All of a sudden it, it evokes a feeling. Like yeah. when you like watch that North Face commercial or you watch that Nike commercial, it evokes an emotion. And you're like, when you're spending your dollar, you're actually proud to spend the dollar. Yeah, because of the emotion and the message that they are sending, and yep. so like by that, as a consumer, it makes you honestly psychologically feel better about yourself because yeah. of, like this message that they're going thing, and then you're actually supporting it by consuming. Right, right. Think of it this way: like you mentioned the word awareness, and they're showing that they have awareness, and in showing that they are aware, they're showing that they're awake. Mm -hmm. Right, and the opposite of that is that they're asleep. Mm -hmm. why would people want to support a brand that is asleep? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I want to support brands that are aware and are awake. I don't want to support brands that are sleeping at the wheel. So yeah. for, for a brand, it's as, just think of it as simply as that. Like we want to look like we're awake. That's it. And we're aware. And it's funny how like the words woke, mm -hmm. like, you know, woke and awake and aware are so like similar. And mm -hmm. then the opposite of those are just like sleeping, dead, Dusty. Like you don't want to be that, you know what I mean? But no. if you're if you're not acknowledging what's happening now, then you are asleep at the wheel. Gotcha. No, for sure. Um, and I just was curious because I wanted to talk to you a little bit, like because like Chime had done a really interesting um infomercial with 21 Savage talking about um financial literacy and then looking at it's kind of like the beats by Dre that we just talked about, the whole if you love me. Yeah, um, made powerful. Yep. For sure, and I just think that's an interesting thing of looking at um, the credibility that way, and letting honestly letting people tell their story in an authentic way. Yeah, and, and I think that was the interesting thing of just like some of the um, heritage of the North Face with their like their, their their brand is talking about different people and their heritage and and. and and honestly, that's kind of like the interesting thing about the whole steep tech and like Alex Lowe and like Conrad and just like, it's a long history of developing things in the outdoors and being aware of, of trying to get people to this space, you know? And yeah. so I think that was a really interesting um, thing talking about that. And, and it's like, I've been talking with Conrad and it's just like, he's just, he's such an interesting person because he encourages diversity and encourages curiosity and he encourages like um, that quality of life. And he talks about some of like his things with climbing and past uh, North Face trips with being involved with the Nepalese community. And I think the way that he looks at culture is the way that kind of like maybe I'm looking at culture in the outdoors and you're looking at culture and streetwear. And I think that's an interesting way of like keeping that curiosity, but also maintaining. And I think that's the interesting thing of like looking at the whole reset, right? Like it's like kind of like changing your brain to honestly like open your eyes and look yeah. at what's going on around you and be more aware and then making a kind of conscious decisions 
on your surroundings, how you're affecting people, how you're affecting yourself, um, how you're affecting the world, like with climate change. Yeah. So, you mentioned the 21 Savage thing and how he talks about financial advice. Um, and that was that was a great campaign. And if you mm -hmm. look at um, the podcast that you mentioned, I do the business of hype. Mm -hmm. uh, all the you know, we've interviewed over like 100 people now. Mm -hmm. And the common thread that I try to do when I interview these people is not just talk about the uh, the, the story of believe in what you do, follow your passion, follow your dreams. That's not enough anymore. Like we yeah. got we know we should follow our dreams, but like how much debt should I take out? How many lawyers do I need? You know, what kind of copywriting do I need to do? Like how many credit cards should I max out? These are the questions that that I really want to get out of people because I think the young generation now, when they're starting out, whether it's like their first job out of college, trying to start a brand, they really want like the hard facts. They don't need sugarcoating anymore, you know? No, so sure. give me yeah. of information. And I think right. that's an interesting thing. Like one thing that Drika talks about in your show is having the, like the, the linear thought pattern as well as kind of like the, I guess sort of like sporadic thought pattern, yeah. you know? It's like yeah. being able to combine the two of like, you want to create these amazing art pieces and you want to create these notions. You want to go to these different places and do these different things. I'm like, you want to move the world. But realistically, like sometimes like building the house means having a great foundation. Like, you know, yeah. like, you kind of have to like kind of figure out how to lay those bricks and lay those bricks right or your house is going to come down. Yep. And so sometimes I, that's yeah. learning yourself. Sometimes that's helping others to do that. And sometimes it's honestly people like when you're looking at, we're talking about companies, right? And they're looking at bringing people in from multicultural marketing. Sometimes it's like they've built a great foundation and they need kind of an anarchist to kind of come and paint the room orange. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, like, so because that's what's going to set it off when you open the entryway, you know? Yeah. And the way I, I see it is like there's, um, there's two types of people in the world. One are like uh, what I call T-shaped people, meaning like they go across a horizon line. And then other ones are I-shaped people, meaning they go deep, like down, you know? Mm -hmm. And I-shaped people, like they – they're very focused on one or two things, but they get like 30,000 feet deep into it. Whereas 2K people can juggle 50 different things at the same time, but they never get really deep into any of them. They just sort of go across the board. Now, if you're an I-shaped person, you should know that you need T-shaped people in your team and vice versa. It, there's very few people who can hop the line between two and I, you know, like Drika, you mentioned, is a great example of a of a of a dual sided person. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like just know that, like, okay, I am very hyper focused on this one thing. I need yeah. team players that will think wider for me, and vice yeah. versa. No, and that's honestly like kind of coming into this collab and kind of, or not collabs, but coming into this space of doing this stuff with the North Face. Like, I have two great mentors basically that kind of come about as, as far as like one's Arturo Nunez who ran Nike basketball. Like if you haven't had him, you should get him on your show. He's amazing. He's like, he's the godfather. He's the OG. And honestly, just with talking to Conrad, it's like, it's like, I feel like I'm the weird child of these two fathers yeah, who are guiding my hand kind of thing because I've come from, I lived in DC for a while, but I lived in Alaska mainly. And so I've got this weird connection of both street and mountains and I'm seeing these things in different ways and different path. And so I think that's where looking at how to go about connecting people into the city wear and street wear and outdoors. It's like, it's like building this bridge yep. and like we're like, you know, like people used to stand on these other sides of these cliffs and look at one side of the other here and one side of the other here. And what we're solely trying to do is we're trying to just like build this bridge where people kind of like can connect together. You know, I, I, I had the opportunity to do a talk on the North Face channel over the summer with like, yeah. uh, Ashima Chiraishi, one of their yeah. star athletes. And she is the embodiment of what you just said. Like okay. city girl born and born and raised in Manhattan, in Central Park, mm -hmm. but is one of the best climbers in the world and can climb any degree of mm -hmm. mountain or, or rock. Anywhere, okay. you know, but hails from Chelsea, New York City. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, I've looked into her. She seems fascinating. Yeah, she's amazing. Okay. Um, so uh, the one thing I actually do want to ask you a little bit about is just like kind of circling back to like Supreme and like some of the uh, 
the Mason Margella collabs that you've kind of been working on in that regard and kind of see how you see those fitting together in this matrix that we're kind of creating this bridge. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, I, I just recently got um, the Margella. I, I have it here, actually. I mean, check oh, out, yeah. yeah, check out this. So you've seen this sort of like kind of classic, like North Face fleece jacket, right? But check out mm -hmm. this Margella one. Okay. It's a circle. That's awesome. Can you see this? Yeah, no, yeah, okay, I got that. I'm checking it out for sure. The whole thing is a circle. It's amazing, and it fits mm -hmm. amazingly, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know that, and I'm actually wearing, um, I'm wearing a North Face the Kai shirt right now. If you if you check it out, they've got like, they've got like the whole zipper, that kind of zipper action with the with the placket on a t-shirt, on a flash dry mm -hmm. t-shirt, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's just, I love the innovation of taking high fashion, street fashion, graffiti. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, there's a Gucci collaboration coming as well. Like just taking all these worlds and just putting them into like a Vitamix blender and just blending it up and then seeing what comes out of it, you know? And I think I love that kind of thinking. It's, it's so dope. And it, it really is another way of innovation. There's, there's the traditional word of innovation, which North mm -hmm. Face is so good at, but yeah. then there's, there's innovative thinking as well. Mm -hmm. And I, I think any brand, even if you don't have you know, a multi-million dollar R&D lab and a testing center, you can be innovative as well, you know? And it's like funny because, I mean, here's the thing that's interesting with me. I'm such a like function oriented person. Like all my stuff is like super function oriented. Like it's like, I mean, I'm probably not that fashionable all to be completely honest. <laughs> like my fashion is non-fashion, but it's like, but I love functionality and seeing how things go and kind of interesting of like, Again, I'm being to circle back to Trika, but she was talking about how like designers like there's got to be a reason for it being blue, and there's got to be a reason for it like being a color of that kind of pattern. And the thing that's really interesting to me of diving into the urban, the city, and like um, um, culture of that is like there doesn't have to be reasons for things. It's just the way that people are feeling, or the way they actually want to like go about doing stuff, or just checking things out. And I think that's really amazing because it all of a sudden like in a weird kind of sense when you're coming from such a functional type a brain of mind, it frees my mind. Yeah. Like it frees up and like, it gets me kind of like creatively thinking about how to see the world in a different space and also like seeing what's going on in different people's heads. Like it's like, it was interesting. Like when I'm living in New York and kind of checking out like five points and then going and seeing what like, uh, the PS MoMA is, was doing, like, you know how they do like dance parties over there on the weekends and stuff like that. Yeah. And, that was the most interesting thing of like going into that space and like seeing they had food vendors and they had music and they had DJs and you could wander through different rooms and art. At a and, museum, like that's weird, right? Like at a museum is kind of not what you would expect. And it's great. Like it was like such an amazing thing. And so like looking at that, it's like almost like that's where we're kind of trying to build this new world around. You know, yeah. like it was just like the thing. Definitions, man. Break those rules. Break those yeah. defined roles of like, oh, you're a museum. You shouldn't be having live yeah. food and DJs. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, like a new yeah. humanity theme park. <laughs> yeah. Or quite frankly, like when I had my streetwear store, mm -hmm. I had art exhibitions out of there, and people were saying like, why do you think you're a museum? Like, why are you having art shows at a streetwear store? You know? It's like I mean, why not? Inspiration. Like anything's yeah. inspiration. You know. So I think that's a good way to kind of go about and try and keeping inspiration and keeping curious. And um, I think kind of the last thing that I really wanted to kind of touch on for, for me and was curious about was looking at how you're connecting with people in a digital space in COVID times. Like, I mean, that's where I'm curious because like just pivoting brands and stuff where like people don't have touch points and ways to go and like see your collabs in person and things like that. How are you getting that word out there? How are you kind of pivoting from like, you know, like the read art department and stuff like that? How are you going about doing that? Yeah, to me, I mean, the digital space is really just another delivery platform, right? Okay. Like I remember and, and you're going to remember these days too where everything was done in print and everything needed to be 600 BPI, CMYK, saved as an EPS or a TIFF, saved onto a zip drive, FedEx mm -hmm. to a printer, you get blue lines, you get proofs. This was like to make one ad or one poster. It yeah. was hundreds of hours of work to make this one thing. And so what, what happens as a result of that is that people are super careful, super dialed. They mm -hmm. cross every T, dot every I before they send something to print. The equivalent of that today is an IG post, right? And you could literally do that while you're sitting on your toilet bowl. 
<laughs> right? And if you, if you mess up the caption, you can hit the edit button. Yeah, you can go back. Yep, if you mess up the photo, delete the post, repost it, right? And yeah. so because now there's this very much more carefree way of doing things, I think there's this issue that's happening where people who are making comments on social media, mm-hmm. whether it's on Twitter or in the comments of Instagram, they they are mistaking creating commentary as creating content. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're really two very separate things, you know? Mm-hmm. And, you know, you said you grew up in, in D.C. as well, so you know that, like, if you see two people having an argument in the street, mm-hmm. and if you stepped up to those two people in person, and you're like, yo, you shut the fuck up and you shut the fuck, like, you're going to get your ass whooped, right? Yeah, consequence. Yeah, there's consequence. But mm-hmm. today, you could just be like, yo, you suck, shut up. And, like, there's no quant- – you could build a burner account, you know, like, it's – and people think you that – KD on them? <laughs> People just, need to, people just need to recognize that like you know um to be more mindful like you were just saying about things that they put out there um sure. things that they put out in the internet the thing about the internet is the internet never forgets yeah you put out a tweet and and you want to delete it someone's taking a screenshot of that and that's just going to live on forever you know so yeah. i would i would advise people to still have the ability um, to to take consequence in what they're doing, still cross the T, still dot the I's, even though it's all social. And I think because we take the time, effort, and and sweat equity that we put into even just like a tweet or an IG post, I think our consumers and our fans recognize that we put that DNA into everything that we do, and they they pay it back to us for that. Um, so well, it's a well, that's 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 credibility. That. Yeah, I guess that's credibility. Yeah, but yeah. yeah. Sure. Like just being thoughtful in your credibility and like coming with a purpose. So I think that's a great place to wrap it up there. And just from here on out, trying to come out with a purpose. And thank you so much for joining, Jeff. I, I really appreciate and it. Thank and you thanks for North Face, oh. <laughs> North Face for allowing us to have this platform too. It's yeah, for sure. I was, I was sort of uh, I was walking down memory lane on my IG stories about my relationship with North Face as a kid, and it's just amazing uh-huh. that we're here right now. You know, it's it's freaking cool. Yeah, no, for sure, man. I had a steep tech outfit myself, so it was kind of funny, just like so random. So yeah, yeah great stuff. Well, if you wanna if you wanna keep in touch, follow me on Instagram and Twitter. I'm at Jeff Staple, um, and thanks a lot, to everyone, for tuning in. Okay, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Peace.